fasten your seatbelts. This last week, what's amazing is over Shabbat, that's the time of revelation. I, I've had several people asking me, what about this blood red moon that's coming up? You know, is there any significance to it? And there's always significance to these, but I wanted to really get in and find out, uh, is there anything in more detail in line with what I already knew? And I tell you what, this is going to be a shocker. Are you ready? Now, this may go a little bit longer, but okay, let me begin. First off, many of you are familiar with what is called the Shemitah cycle. That's the seven-year time frame, and the seventh year is a year of rest. Just so you know where we are, now I have 21 on two lines because each one of those dividing lines is Rosh Hashanah of that year. This is based on the biblical calendar, the biblical year, not our year. So you see Rosh Hashanah in 2016, you know, 2015, 2016. So that's what each one of those are. Now, here is the next seven-year cycle, but you have to understand they're connected. There's not a roof, enough room on my screen to have them side by side. You following me? So this goes right down to there. Now, what people are asking about is this bl a super blood moon that occurs on uh, right here. Let me put this up. May 26, which is Savon 15. Just a reminder, according to math, according to science, you can only have a total lunar eclipse when there's a full moon. You can only have a total solar eclipse on a new moon. Okay, that's just how it works. Okay, so here we have May 26, Savon 15. Well, most don't know there's another lunar eclipse, a partial, coming up this November as well. November 19th, which is Kislev 15, which is right before Hanukkah. So we have these eclipses in May and in November. Now there's another one coming up May of next year. And then again, in November of next year. So we have these four blood moons in a row. Sound familiar? Okay. The only difference is one of them is a partial. But here is, I believe, what is the main significance is when they are happening. They are like a link in a chain that is connecting two Shemitah cycles, the end of one Shemitah cycle and the beginning of another Shemitah cycle, just like the four blood moons that happened in 2014 and 2015 that connected the last Shemitah cycle. Okay, so the question now that I believe everyone has that loves prophecy is what time is it? Okay. Okay. So what we're going to be talking about, we know, how many of you heard of Daniel's 70 weeks? Well, that's one of the gears. We've got the Shemitah cycle. We got the year of Jubilee. Everyone wants to know how do these gears connect? So here's what we have to understand. Christians need to get on the biblical calendar. God does not work off of our calendar. He set his own up from the beginning. And so we need to be on God's appointed times. Now, listen to this on your notes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, concerning the what? Times and seasons. Now, when it says seasons here, is he saying now concerning winter, spring, summer, and fall? No, that's not what he's talking about. So now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, let me say something about the day of the Lord. When it says the day of the Lord, that doesn't refer to a 24-hour day. It refers to a time frame. The day of the Lord more than likely could be seven years, three and a half years. This is the, it's a time frame of the day of the Lord. But look at what this says. How many of you have heard that he comes as a thief in the night? Okay, that doesn't mean you're to be stupid. That doesn't mean you're to be in darkness. 
Look what it says. When people are saying there's peace and security, that is when sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But look at this next line. I have in bold and underlined. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. Why? Because you are children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. Okay. When the world was created, it was dark, and he introduced lights. This very phrase in 1 Thessalonians 5 comes from Genesis 1.14. Look at this. And God said, let there be what? Lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for what? Signs. We think God created the sun and the moon just for heat and light, but no, he created them for signs. And let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. Well, guess what? The word seasons here also does not refer to winter, spring, summer, or fall. And it says days and years. He says, let them be for light in the expense of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. When it says days and years, it's not referring to 1872. It's referring to the Shemitah year. The Jubilee year, when it says days, it's referring to the holy days, the Sabbath days, okay? The, the Hebrew word moed, which is the word for seasons, literally means for the appointed times, Passover, because Passover was on a full moon, okay? Sukkot is on a full moon. Rosh Hashanah is on a new moon. God created the sun and the moon and the stars for the appointed time so we would know when his feast days are. Now, look at Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 2. For everything there is a what? A season and a time for every purpose or matter under heaven. How many purposes? So don't you think the coming of the Messiah, there is a season and a time as well? A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what has been planted. Okay, so look here at this clock in the sky. The problem, if believers aren't on God's calendar, they won't know when plucking time is compared to planting time. They'll be planting at plucking time and plucking at planting time. If there's a season and a time for every purpose under heaven, we got to know when to pluck. And we got to know when to plant. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I put my words in your mouth. I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to what? Uh, guess what time it is? Plucking time. Okay, this isn't real hard. But sometimes when you pluck things, you plant other things. And so it's time to overthrow, but also to build and to plant. Now, how many of you are familiar with a day with the Lord as a thousand years, right? And everyone believes we have 6,000 years, and then the Messiah comes. This is taught both in Judaism as well as in Christianity, okay? That a day with the Lord is a thousand years, 6,000 years from Adam, roughly, okay? Listen to Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. How many of you have heard that verse before? This is Isaiah now, 40, but he continues to speak. Look at verse 6 through 8. Here we have a voice crying in the wilderness, and the voice says, cry. And he says, well, what am I supposed to cry? And listen to what he says. That all flesh is grass, all the goodliness is as the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades because the Spirit of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand. The word of God stands how long? How long do we last? Not very long. Okay, now we all acknowledge we're living in the end times. But like I said, listen to 2 Peter 3, 8. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. 
This is quoting Psalms. And so here we are. How many know we're close to the 6,000 years? So how many believe we're real close to the day of the Lord? Yes. All right. This is just makes sense. Listen to Hosea. Chapter 5, the closing verses 14 through 6 2. Listen to what God says. I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I want to stop there because there's something I saw yesterday that I hadn't really seen before. If you remember, kingdom of Israel was divided in half. South was Judah, north was Ephraim. Okay? And he's... I tell you what, if I want to be attacked, I'd rather be attacked by a young lion than a mature lion. <laughs> They're both bad. But I think it's interesting. He's going to be like a big lion to Ephraim and a young lion to the house of Judah. Well, get a load of this. If you get our calendar that we have every year, and if you've been following our teachings, each tribe is associated with one of the months. Well, guess what month is assigned to Judah? Nisan. Messiah is from the tribe of Judah. This is when he died. Okay. And Ephraim, guess what month is Ephraim? It begins on the first of Tishri, Rosh Hashanah. So I think what's interesting when he's saying what he's going to do to Ephraim and to Judah also lines up with the months that they will happen in. Now, listen to what is prophesied. He says, I will tear. He says, I, even I will tear and go away. I will carry off and no one will rescue. And so we all know Messiah came and he died and then he returned to his place. Right? Look what Hosea says. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and in their distress earnestly seek me. When does that happen? In Tishri, the month of Ephraim. Now, it says, come and let us return to the Lord for he has torn us that he may heal us. He doesn't tear us to destroy us. He tears us because we need healing. He struck us down, but guess what? He's going to bind us up. Now, look at this. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. The Lord rose the third day. The nation of Israel, as the rest of humanity, will also rise the third day for the millennial reign when we will live in his sight. Now, <clears throat> It says, after two days is when this happens. A day with the Lord is how many years? How many ever heard of uh, uh, this young man here, Tiberius? Okay. His reign was 14 AD to 37 AD, the emperor of Rome. This is just common history. Look at the gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. In the... 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judah, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of all these places. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance, the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. He was proclaiming the Messiah. And that's when the Messiah came and showed up on the scene and waved high. Okay. Well, guess what? It just got done saying it was in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. You take 14 AD plus the 15th year, that equals 29 AD. You add the 2,000 years, that takes you to 2029. Get out of town. <laughs> there is your two days. That would give you exactly 2,000 years, two days of 2029. Okay. Now, the other big question is this. 
How long is a generation? Great question. There are many different times. We're going to look at them. We know that it talks about as in the days of Noah, right? In Genesis 6. And we see in Genesis 6, 3, then the Lord said, my spirit will not abide in man forever for his flesh. His days will be 120 years. So his generation from the time he started building the boat to when it was in, that generation was considered to be 120 years. Well, the amazing thing, the first Zionist Congress with Theodore Herzl was August 29th of 1897. The amazing thing about that, that was on the first of a lull. And when you look at 1897, you add 120, that takes you to 2017. So from that standpoint, that generation of 120 years has passed. Well, let's look at Genesis 15, 6 with Abraham. Here, a generation seems to be 100 years, not 120. In Genesis 15, verse 5 and 6, he brought Abraham forth abroad. And he said, look to the heavens and count the stars, if you can count them. And he said to him, so shall your seed be. And he believed the Lord. He counted to him for righteousness. So here we see he's to look to the heavens. And the heavens are signs. And the stars were signs of how many kids he was going to have or his seed. Well, let's look at the next few verses in verse 13 through 16. And God tells Abram, know the surety that your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them. How many years? All right. So we have 400 years and also that nation whom they will serve. I'm going to judge and afterward they'll come out with great substance, but you shall go to your fathers in peace. You'll be buried in a good old age. And in the fourth generation, they'll come back here for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. So if it's 400 years and it's four generations, here a generation is 100 years. Now, the fascinating thing about the Hebrew language, every letter is also a number. And guess what? The letter Tav is 400 and Tav means sign. Tav means a mark or a sign, which is what the stars were created for. Okay, now let's go for a moment to Matthew 24. How many have heard of Matthew 24. That's all about the end times. And what does Yeshua, Jesus, tell his disciples on the Mount of Olives? You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this has to take place, but the end is not yet. Okay, let's put your yarmulkes on for a minute here and put yourself sitting on the Mount of Olives with Yeshua 2,000 years ago. So you got to go back 2,000 years. You're sitting on the Mount of Olives. And he says, you're going to hear of wars. What wars comes to your mind? What were the last wars Israel fought? Okay. The two big wars Israel's fought was Nebuchadnezzar destroying Babylon. And the key date is the 9th of Av. Okay. The 9th of Av, that's the day the temple was destroyed twice. And what other big event? Hanukkah. That happened in 186, so what, uh, the temple destroyed in 587, and then 168 is what I meant, right? 168 is Hanukkah. That was the big war where the temple was defiled. So when you're sitting there, you're thinking, wow, the temple that we're looking at here is going to be destroyed again. Oh, my goodness. Hanukkah is going to happen again. Are you following me? You got to put on their... Yamaka. All right. So here's the next thing. How many believe the Bible also applies to us? He wasn't just talking to them. He's talking to us. Okay. Well, here's the thing. What big war would we might be able to apply this to is World War I in this last generation or century. Well, guess what? World War I started on the 9th of Av, the same day the temple was destroyed. Connector, connector. Yeshua was talking to this generation. Okay, well, guess what else? World War I, it was during Hanukkah that General Allenby took Jerusalem. Hello. So 
in our Christian mind, we need to realize, wow, this generation that saw World War I is an end-time generation, okay? Now, the Balfour Declaration was on November 2nd, 1917. But the amazing thing about that, on the biblical calendar, it was Heshvan 17, the very day of Noah's flood. And he says, as it was in the days of Noah. Well, guess what? This big event about creating an Israeli nation happens on the very same day of Noah's flood. Well, so there, from 1917, you add 100 years, that takes you to 2017 also. Again, it's like that 100-year generation has been fulfilled. Oh, and it was, uh, yeah, December 11th of 1917 when General Allenby entered Jerusalem, and that was Kislev 26 during Hanukkah. Okay, let's go back to Matthew 24 for a minute. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun is darkened, the moon will not give her light. Hmm, I wonder if that's because he created the sun and the moon for signs. Hello? And the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heavens will be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He'll send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they'll gather together his elect from the four winds and from the end of heaven to the other. Now it says, learn a parable of the fig tree. Who's the fig tree? Israel. When its branch is tender and puts forth leaves, no summer is nigh. So likewise, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily, I tell you, this generation will not pass till all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away. But again, what do we find? His words will not pass away. Okay, so here he's talking about the generation tied to the parable of the fig tree. Okay, well, get a load of this. What year are we in right now? 5781. That's the year we're in right now. All right. You have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the book of Revelation of the Torah. As a matter of fact, the Song of Moses we hear about that's being sung in Revelation comes from Deuteronomy. Well, get a load of Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1 and 2. I want you to get the context. This isn't on your notes. You can just write it on your notes. I have it in my PowerPoint instead. God is telling them about all the blessings if they obey and the cursings if they do not obey. And then he says, when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I set before you and call them to mind among the nations where the Lord your God has driven you. And then you return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and you obey his voice and all I command you today with all your heart, with all your soul. Guess what happens in verse three? Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes. He'll have mercy on you. He will gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. You know what is amazing about this verse? This verse is the 5,708th verse of the Torah. It so happens the year 5708 was 1948, the very year that that verse was fulfilled. So the 5,708th verse of the Torah is also the year 5708, which is 1948, which is when he had mercy and gathered them from all the nations where they've been scattered. Okay? How many of you know there's no coincidences? Israel become a nation in 1940 was huge prophetically. Now, how many of you know Israel is strong? They've got great strength. Matter of fact, Israel is ranked the eighth most powerful country in the world. Very powerful. As a matter of fact, this comes from uh, Israel website. Uh, it's the Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I want you to notice it talks about the War of Independence was not just 1948. It began in 47 and it went all the way through 1949. It's amazing that there were four blood moons during that time frame of 1949. Well, guess what? 1948, 1949. Look at Psalms 90, 10. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Well, guess what? 80 years from 1948, 49 takes you to that same year, 2028, 2029, when we fly away. 
Now, watch this. Let's see. Where do I want to go here? How many of you know the moon is a lot smaller than the earth? Well, guess what? Look at the size of the earth and the moon compared to the sun. How in the world, I don't know if you can see this little teeny tiny dot right there. How in the world, if you're standing here with this little dot in front of you, it can completely block out the sun and the moon and the sun look like they're the same size? It has to do with math and science. It just so happens the sun is 400 times larger than the moon and it is 400 times further away. That's why your thumb can block out a building. It's the same concept. But guess what? There are no coincidences with God. There's an all-important number associated with the Torah account of the Egyptian exile and the 400 years. The relationship between the sun and the moon and the years predicted for the Egyptian exile share the number 400. Why? So we could be attentive to the powerful divine message. They knew, Abraham was informed that God would first bring darkness to his descendants. And he says there'll be strangers in a strange land. Well, guess what? The number 40 is very significant. It's the days of warning that Jonah gave Nineveh. Okay. It's also the days of the flood rains. Uh, it's the amount of time Moses spent on Mount Sinai. Well, here it is times 10. Well, again, this 400, God created the sun and the moon for signs. Well, the sun and the moon have a 400 to 1 relationship. That is the letter Tav again. Okay? So the eclipses as well as Abraham's vision is all tied. Now, here's what's crazy. The, how many of you have different fonts on your computer? You can pick your own font. The ancient Hebrew font did not look like that letter Tav. The ancient Hebrew font was like an X. If you remember, when you go to sign your signature, if you don't know how to spell, you would put an X because an X marks the spot. Tav means mark. It means sign or signature. That's where the whole concept of putting an X on a signature, if you couldn't spell, goes back to the letter Tav. Well, guess what? We have the letter Tav occurring with solar eclipses coming up. Right on the United States, this is a bullseye. God's marking a solar eclipse. How many know the sun's bigger than the moon? Right. How many know the pagans go, their calendar goes by the sun? Okay, so the sun represents the nations, the moon represents Israel. Solar eclipses represent a warning to the nations, lunar eclipses represent a warning to the nation of Israel. Here we have a prophetic bullseye right there in southern Illinois. August 21st, 2017 was the Great American Eclipse. Went west to east. April 8th, 2024, goes south to north. They say that if you were to stand in one place, the chance of you seeing a total solar eclipse is one in 300 years. Okay? Not that you can't see a solar eclipse on TV or you can't see it, but to actually see one in the very same spot... And here there's one in seven years, number seven. Okay. This is God's bullseye. Now, let me tell you a little something about that spot. Guess what it is known as for the last several hundred years? It's been known as Little Egypt. The very place where these solar eclipses at their greatest totality of time of darkness happens right there. As a matter of fact, why is it called Little Egypt? Well, one thing, there was a famine a couple hundred years ago in northern Illinois. They all had to go down to the bread basket in southern Illinois, which is why they went there. But look at this. They also have a Goshen. They've got Thebes, Karnak, Cairo. Look at the bottom, Cairo. This whole area is known as Little Egypt. You can't make this stuff up. 
let's zero in a little bit more on this area. Now you'll notice here is Carbondale, kind of in the center. I'm going to focus on this area right in here. Okay, I want you got to see this. This is where southern, southeastern Illinois College is. Do you see that with the red dot? Let me put a little pyramid or triangle uh, <laughs> right there. And I'm going to expand that area. Although Illinois was a free state before the American Civil War, some residents in Little Egypt still owned slaves, just as there were slaves in Egypt. Illinois law generally forbade bringing slaves into Illinois, but a special exemption was given to the salt works near equality. Right there, equality. <laughs> kind of sounds like the equal rights today sometimes. Now, this is from the Southern Illinois Wikipedia. But wait, there's more. This is Southeastern Illinois College's own website. I'm not going to read all that to you, but the bottom part says this. In 1960, when Southeastern Illinois College was formed, a sphinx was included in the official seal of the college to honor the Little Egypt heritage shared by the people of the college district. A few years later, when a logo was created for Southeastern, it incorporated yet another Egyptian symbol, the pyramid. Southeastern's competitive teams have always had the falcon as their mascot. In Egypt, the king was thought of as a living god. While alive, he was Horus, the falcon-headed sky god, sitting on the magic Isis throne. When he died, he became Osiris, god of the underworld, and his heir became Horus. Here is Horus, the falcon god. Notice the solar, the sun above his head. This is their logo, the falcon god in the pyramid. They're known as the falcons. This is where it intersects. Seven years apart, these total solar eclipses. Now, you also have to remember uh, in the story of Joseph, there was seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine concerning Egypt, right? Just tuck that in the back of your mind for a minute. Okay, the plagues. A lot of people, how many ever heard of the plagues that went on in Egypt? How long did the plagues last from beginning to end? I can tell you exactly how long they lasted. It's all in the Bible if you do a little digging, and it's called reverse engineering here. They, all the 10 plagues took place in a, in a five-week time period. Five weeks, and I will prove it to you very quickly. Moses was born on the seventh of Adar. He also died on the seventh of Adar. The first thing you have is the Nile turns to blood last seven days. If you'll notice in red, I have every scripture verse that you can follow along to see when all these plagues took place uh, with the frogs and the lice and the flies, the cattle dying, the boils, the hailstones of fire, the locusts, the three days of darkness. Then they looted all the Egyptians with everything. Uh, then they had to grab the lamb on the tenth of Nisan. And then they slew the Passover lamb. At midnight, everyone died and they packed their bags and left. Okay? But I want you to notice the three days of darkness took place, began right around Nisan 1. Now, here we have our total lunar eclipse bullseye. You can only have a solar eclipse on a new moon. Guess what? This total solar eclipse takes place on Nisan 1. The very same day, the days of darkness happened in Egypt 3,500 years ago is the very same day it happens in 2024 on Nisan 1. And this is when Moses, the Lord told him, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven. There was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. That's when this total solar eclipse happens in 2024 over little Egypt. And guess what else happened on Nisan 1? In Exodus 12, 1 and 2, that's when God said to Moses, see this new moon? That is to be the beginning of the months for you. 
That determines the biblical calendar. And in Exodus 41, that was the very day Moses' tabernacle was set up and the glory fell. That's when this eclipse is taking place. Okay, now, here's the thing. Back to our gears. We need to understand God's calendar. We have the weekly gear, the Shabbat, the monthly gear, the new moons, the yearly gear, which refers to the Moedim, Passover, Shabbat, and the likes, okay? Well, guess what? All those Moedim, let's put over here on the yearly Moedim gear, but then you have the seventh Shemitah year, and that's tied in to the Jubilee, the 50th year, okay? So here we go. Uh, we have creation, and we're looking at days and weeks and months and years, all right? So, I mean, we have to understand the biblical calendar. Believers need to get off our pagan calendar, and if we want to know what God's doing, we got to get on his calendar, Okay, let me see where I'm at here. So let's take a minute and let's look at this now. Let's go to Leviticus 25. God told Israel that the land that they would be inheriting, it also needed to rest every seven years because it was holy, right? Listen to Leviticus 25, 1 through 4. And the Lord spoke to Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years you're to sow your field. Six years you'll prune your vineyard and gather in the fruit. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest to the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. You're not to sow your field or prune your vineyard. So that's the Shemitah year. There's the seven-year Shemitah cycle, and the seventh year is the Shemitah year. What else happens? Look at Exodus chapter 23, verse 10 through 12. Six years you're to sow your land and gather in the fruits, but the seventh year you will let it rest and lie still. Why? Why? so that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave, the wildlife may eat. In like manner, you will deal with your vineyard, with your olive yard. Six days you're to work, the seventh day rest, so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your handmaid, the stranger, may be refreshed. The Hebrew word shemitah literally means a release. It's like debts were also to be released. This is where the seven-year bankruptcy thing came from. It came from this, okay? People were to no longer be indebted as slaves or servants to one another. Listen to Deuteronomy 15, 1 and 2. At the end of seven years, you're to make a release, and this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lends ought to his neighbor shall release it. He will not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother because it is called the Lord's release. Okay, that's Leviticus 25. Now, you can check this out later. Leviticus 26, verses 18 through 45, we're going to touch on. That's where God tells Israel the importance of keeping that seventh year as a Shemitah year, as God warns Israel of the catastrophic consequences of disobedience to his laws. When he states several times, they will be punished seven times more for their sins. In other words, you keep the seventh year of rest or you'll be punished seven more times. And if you still don't, I'll punish you seven more times. And if you still don't, I'll punish you seven more times. And by the way, if you still don't, I'll punish you seven more times. Look at this. Leviticus 26, 18. And if you will not yet for all this hearken to me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Why? They didn't keep the seventh year. Leviticus 26, 21. If you still walk contrary to me and will not hearken to me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. Verse 24. Then will I also walk contrary to you and I will punish you yet seven more times for your sins. Verse 27 and 28. And if you will not for all this hearken to me, but walk contrary to me, I will walk contrary to you also in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you. How many more times? Seven more times. Do we see a connection here? 
you don't keep the seventh year, I'm going to punish you seven more times. And if you thought that was bad, exponentially, it'll be seven more. And if you thought that was bad, it'll be, it gets worse and worse and worse each time. Look at verse 33 through 35. God says, I'm going to scatter you among the heathen. I'll draw out a sword after you and your land will be desolate and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath as long as it lies desolate and you are in your enemy's land. Even then will the land rest and it'll get to enjoy her Sabbath as long as it lies desolate. It'll rest because it did not rest in your Sabbath when you dwelt on it. Now look at verse 43 of Leviticus 26. The land also will be left to them and shall enjoy her Sabbath when she lies desolate without them and they shall accept the punishment of their iniquity because even because they despise my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes. Now we come to Leviticus 26, verse 44 and 45. And it says, and yet for all that, when they're in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. Neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord, their God, but I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen that I might be their God. I am the Lord. Okay, so what happens almost 1,000 years later when they're in Israel and Nebuchadnezzar comes. Look at Jeremiah 34, 13 through 17. We see the fulfillment of a thousand year old prophecy. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, hey, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day I brought them out of Egypt, out of the house of bondmen, saying, at the end of seven years, let you go every man his brother a Hebrew, which has been sold to you, and when he has served you six years, you're to let him go free from you. But your fathers did not listen to me. They did not incline their ear. And you were now turned and you did right in my sight by proclaiming liberty every man to his neighbor. And you made a covenant before me in the house, which is called by my name. But now you've turned and polluted my name. And you've caused every man a servant and every man his handmaid, whom you had set at liberty at their pleasure to return and brought them back into subjection to be unto you for servants and handmaids. Therefore, says the Lord, you've not listened to me in proclaiming liberty, everyone to his brother and every man to his neighbor. Behold, God says, I proclaim a liberty for you, says the Lord. But guess what? It's to the sword, pestilence, famine. I will make you to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. So this prophecy was literally fulfilled around a thousand years later. Let me see. Look what the consequences were. Let's go a minute and let's take a minute back to Leviticus 26 and just look at one of the consequences. In verse 28 and 29, God says, I will walk contrary to you in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. You will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters is what you're going to eat. Well, a thousand years later, back to Jeremiah 19, verse 7 through 9. God says, I will make void the counsel of Judah and Jerusalem in this place. I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hands of them that seek their lives. Their carcasses I will give to be meat for the fowls of heaven, for the beasts of the earth. I will make this city desolate and the hissing. Everyone that passes thereby will be astonished and hiss because of all the plagues. I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and they shall eat every one of the flesh of his friend. And the siege and straightness were with the enemies, and they that seek their life shall straight to them. This is... A prophecy, a thousand years, who but God could say this is going to happen and then have it happen a thousand years later. Okay? And it was the whole reason they went into captivity and all these catastrophic consequences happened was because they did not honor the Shemitah year in releasing what they were supposed to release. It was over 490 year time frame which means that the land got to rest the 70 years all at one time. Now, how many of you know Israel could not arbitrarily keep the Shemitah year when they wanted to? Well, my Shemitah year, I'm going to start next year. That's my Shemitah. The Lord is my Shemitah, and I'm going to do it on Thursday. I, I'm going to have my Shemitah year start here for seven years. Lord, I kept your Shemitah year but not my Shemitah year. You kept your Shemitah year. Okay? We got to get on God's timetable. As a matter of fact, listen to 2 Chronicles 36.1. Why did this all happen? 
It says to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill the 70 years. Look at Jeremiah 29, 10 and 11. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years be accomplished in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. That's also a prophecy he fulfilled at the end of what we just got done reading. Okay, now here comes the big drum roll. All right, Daniel 9, verse 1 and 2. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. He knew that because they didn't keep the Shemitah cycle for 490 years. Okay, now here comes the test question. How many knows Daniel was Jewish? He was even from the tribe of Judah. Okay. And look what he says in Daniel 9, 24 through 26. In the end of this chapter, he goes, okay, 70 weeks are determined upon your people and your holy city. Now, when he says 70 weeks, he's referring to weeks of years, isn't he? And not only that, he's referring to the Shemitah cycle. These 70 weeks could not begin any year. It had to begin the first year of a Shemitah cycle. And it says it's to uh, finish the transgression, make an end of sin, make a reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street will be built again, the wall in troublous times. After 62 weeks, Messiah is going to die, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince that will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. We know that was Rome, 70 AD. And the end thereof will be with the flood to the end of the war. Desolations are determined. Now, how many of you realized historically, prophetically, everything's been fulfilled, but there's one week left. Does everyone understand? There's one week of seven years left. Okay, this is why in Daniel 9, 27, he will confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he'll cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he'll make it desolate, even till the consummation, and that determination will be poured out. Here's what's important. This is, here comes the rock and roll, fasten your seatbelt. Every Christian knows about Daniel 70 weeks. They know there's one week left, but guess what? The tribulation can only start the beginning of a Shemitah cycle. It can't start any day. It can't start any year. The, because it is a Shemitah week that's left, Daniel was Jewish. The tribulation has to start in the first year of a Shemitah cycle. Where are we? We are about to begin the seventh year of a Shemitah cycle. Next, Rosh Hashanah begins the first year of a seven-year cycle. So if the tribulation does not start here, it cannot start until here. There's no way the tribulation can begin anywhere in here. It has to begin the first year. Now, how do we know this is a Shemitah year? These are all divisible by seven. It's not that difficult. So, now, here we go. Let me see. And if it doesn't begin in 2029, it can't begin until 2036. Is everyone understanding? Is everyone getting this? Okay, now, let me see where I'm at. Okay. You see where we are? The lines of Rosh Hashanah. Now, here's what's fascinating here, we had these four blood moons again, and my thought is, could those signs be a, a one-week warning before the tribulation begins? Just like back in 66, 67, it was exactly a one-week warning before what happened in 1973. Well, what happened then? Gee, in the first year of a Shemitah year, we have the Six-Day War of Jerusalem. 
The next beginning of a Shemitah cycle, we have the Yom Kippur War. The next beginning of the seven-year cycle, Israeli jets destroy the Iran nuclear reactor. And then in 87, 88, the beginning of a Shemitah cycle, we have the first intifada. 94, 95 is when the Jordan-Israel peace treaty took place. You know what's amazing about that? That year, the Hebrew year, 5755, guess what verse that is in the Bible? That verse is the uh, Deuteronomy 3130, which begins the Song of Moses that we read about in Revelation. So that verse, 5755, the 5,755th verse of the Torah is the Song of Moses, which is the beginning of the end. Now, then you have in 2001, 2002, Operation Defensive Shield after the second intifada, and that's when the quartet started. Who are the quartet? You got the EU, the UN, United States, and Russia. They decided that year that there has to be a Palestinian state and Israel needs to be divided. Then 2008, 2009, first year Gaza war, stock market crash. Okay, so now here we are. This is where we are right in here. There's the one-week warning or seven-year warning. Okay, we had the first total solar eclipse there. Now we are right here. Okay, we, we have this one that's coming up this May. Then we have the next one in November, followed by the next May, followed by the next November, followed by the next total solar eclipse that crisscrosses everything. Now, what I thought was interesting is if the tribulation does begin next year on Rosh Hashanah, and, and this is the Shemitah week, again, that ends in 2028, 20, 29, which is fascinating, as we already saw. But they say that's when Apophis is supposed to hit, which is also the fulfillment of Daniel, where the rock hits the idol and destroys everything. Okay. Now, I want you to see this. Do you see right in the, if this is, the beginning of the tribulation next year. Here's the middle. This would be the middle. Well, something that's quite uh, fascinating uh, to me here. Let me see where I'm at. Okay, I think, in, yeah, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 through 17. Listen to this. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves where? In the caves, among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide from us, from the face of him who's seated on the throne, from the wrath of the lamb, for the great day of the wrath has come. Who can stand? And this is right in the middle of the tribulation, the, the, the great tribulation. And they want the rocks to fall on them. Well, guess what? That 5786... Guess what? There's your Revelation 615 verse. The 5,786 verse of the Torah is Deuteronomy 32, 31, which is their rock. Is it like our rock? <laughs> They're wanting the rocks to fall on them. And it says our enemies are beside themselves. And then the next year, let's look at Revelation 11, verse 7 and 8. We know the two witnesses are in there, and in the middle of the tribulation, they go. Revelation 11, 7, and 8, when they finish their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of that great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. Wow. Well, guess what? Deuteronomy 32, verse 32, is their vine comes from the vine of Sodom. A direct connection. And from the fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of poison, their clusters are bitter. Those two are tied together with that year. Okay, let me see now where I'm at. Okay, if you see the middle here, okay, let's bring out, guess what? There are total solar lunar eclipses that come right in the middle there as well. And guess, remember I talked about Ephraim and Judah? Yes. Ephraim is Tishri, Rosh Hashanah, 
Judah is Nissan. Get a load of this. Solar eclipses. Nissan 1, Rosh Hashanah. Nissan 1, Rosh Hashanah. Lunar eclipses. Elul 15, right? The days of repentance. Purim. Elul 15, Purim. This is what is happening in the middle of the next seven-year cycle. Now, what I have, let me see. Okay, I want you to see this. What I'm giving you, oh, let me move something for you just to be kind here. This wasn't supposed to be there. This was supposed to be, oops, a second. Let me do this. Okay, now we're going to go to... Here and here. Okay. What I've done for you, and if you want to take a picture of these slides, I don't care. Let me run back through here again. Okay. Here is the Bible verse for every year following that next year. Now, let me say this. Let me see where I'm at. Oh, gosh. Can I have a little more time? I don't, I, I just, this was, this I felt like was a big message. Now, I'm not setting dates. I'm just telling you what the math is, what the signs in the heavens are. And for example, what I'm doing, I'm going to show you the next seven years. Let's say the tribulation doesn't start next year. That means it can't start till the next year. Well, here are the verses for those years, and they look like good possibilities too. So I'm not saying definite next year. Listen to those verses. Okay, I have, uh, let me see where I'm at. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, 35. Now you have to remember this one that's here is tied to here the week before. Vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their foot slips, for the day of their calamity is hand, and their doom comes swiftly. Now, Deuteronomy 32, 36, the next one, the Lord is going to vindicate his people, have compassion on his servants when he sees their power is gone and there's none remaining, bond or free. The next verse, and I have on your notes, Rosh Hashanah 20, 31, so you can have here the, when they occur, Deuteronomy 32, 37, then he will say, where are their gods? The rock in which they took refuge. Rosh Hashanah 20, 32. Uh, we have Deuteronomy 32, 38, who ate the fat of their sacrifices, drank the wine of their drink offering, let them rise up and help you. Let them be your protection. Rosh Hashanah 30, 33, corresponds to Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, even I am he, there is no God beside me. I kill, I make alive, I wound, I heal. There's no one that can deliver out of my hand. 20, 34 is Deuteronomy 32, 40. If I lift my hand to heaven and swear as I live forever, what do we find the next year? Verse 41. I can't help but think of revelation on this one. If I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries. We paid those who hate me. Rosh Hashanah 2036 is Deuteronomy 32, 42. Okay. Which is uh, the very end of that year linked to the next year. And he says, I will make my arrows drunk with blood. My sword will devour flesh, the blood of the slain and the captives from the long haired heads of the enemy. And then the next cycle, uh, 2037, we have Deuteronomy 32, 43. Rejoice with him, O heavens, bow down to him, O gods, and for he avenges the blood of his children. He takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people land. I can't help but think of Ezekiel where they cleanse the land for seven years. Could that be then? Okay. Well, so anyway, those, but guess what else? That ends the Song of Moses. That is where it ends. Okay, so my last thought is this. When is the, when is the year of Jubilee? I don't know, but here's what I do know. The year of Jubilee has to be the first year of a new seven-year cycle because you have all these Shemitah cycles. There's not an extra jump in their 50th year and then begins a whole new week. The 50th year is also the first year. So I got to thinking since 1948, 
what in the world? I would think when they got back to the land, God would punctuate Yom Kippur. This is when it was. Well, what about the Yom Kippur War? If that was the year of Jubilee, after seven weeks, the next year of Jubilee is next Rosh Hashanah. Okay. Now, there's 28, 29 right there. Now, let me ask you this. Here's something else. How long were the Israelites actually in Egypt? At 210 years. Okay. Here's the thing. A Rashi's commentary on the verse in question is that the Israelites were indeed in Egypt for only 210 years since this is the sum one comes to when you add up who begat who. There's no way they could actually have been there. All right. Well, guess what? If we put our year back in there and you add 210 to the year, that puts our calendar at 5999. It begins 6,000. 2829 becomes, when you add the 210 back to the Hebrew calendar, you reach 6,000. And God said in Leviticus 25, 23, concerning the year of Jubilee, the land will not be sold forever. The land is mine. Things return to the Lord. Okay. I'm done. But let me say this. This is why our new calendar that is showing this Shemitah year, and it also shows the beginning of the next seven-year cycle, will be available in two weeks. On June 2nd, right after Memorial Day, June 2nd, you'll be able to order the new calendar that begins at Rosh Hashanah this year. Now, here's the Ephraim is so amazing. That's Tishri. So here's what it looks like. And I'm talking about the prophecy of the Dead Sea coming to life in terms of the last days, which is why we have Ezekiel 47, 8, about the waters returning. And then uh, this is the actual thing. Uh, inside calendar, so let the Shemitah begin. We've got all the holy days in Sukkot marked in the scripture verses. Look at this beautiful picture here. This here, uh, these are all professional photographs from Noam Badin, who's doing the Dead Sea teaching with us, and he gets we give him credit on all of these. Uh, here's the another beautiful one. Now this is September, a lull, and here it talks about his wife turning to a pillar of salt which is quite fascinating. But if you notice on the inside of that one, again, the first of Tishri, for ST 783, that's the beginning of that new seven-year cycle. Uh, the other thing in the calendar, I have my chart in this calendar explaining the Shemitah year, year of Jubilee. We also have this day in history pages, so you can look at the calendar, see what happened. Uh, so anyway, this calendar also goes to 2023. It's all of this year, all of next year. Okay, so again, I am not setting dates uh, for the rapture. I'm not setting dates when the Antichrist is revealed or any particular event that will happen on any specific date. I'm not saying anything will happen on the day of an eclipse. What I'm saying, it's time to prepare you the way of the Lord. Yes. Amen? Yes. All right, let's stand. Uh, Vinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much that we can come together. It's the glory of kings uh, to search out a matter. Father, we, we want, you want to play hide and seek, and we want to go looking for you. Father, we eagerly await your return. We know we are that terminal generation. Father, we just thank you that uh, you have given us insight and wisdom and how we need to be prepared. We don't know the day or the hour, but we know you're coming quickly. So, Father, we just thank you for everyone who's here that's live streaming. We thank you that they, as light to the nations, want to get this message out to all their loved ones, letting them know how time is short and the day of the Lord is truly at hand. Father, you asked 
Moses to tell Aaron to say this prayer over your people. And so doing, not only would you bless them, but you would place your name upon them. And you told him to say, Ivarekaka Adonai Beish Mareka, Yaer Adonai Panavileka Bihuneka. Ye saw Adonai Panavileka Vyasem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen. We'll see you next week.